You're listening to What's Contemporary Now, a show about culture and the people, places, and things that together make it up. Like any other talent known by a singular name, Dara seems to be the walking manifestation of the words, don't dream it, be it. Reminding us why it's always best to play by your own rules when it comes to deciding how it is you want to show up in the world, her willful disregard for any kind of predetermined path is a timely reminder for anyone looking to make shit happen. Beyond just thinking outside the boxes so many understand the world through, her downtown cool kid culture is matched only by her uptown fabulousness. Always one to go for the glam, she can sometimes feel like a reincarnation of an old Hollywood star, but with a touch of Warholian charisma. This is Dara, and we're talking about what's contemporary now. Dara, we always start at the beginning because there's only so much one can find out through rumor mills and online research. But other than having discovered your love for cursive writing as a very young child watching Cinderella, what other moments stand out as formative or having set you upon the path you enjoy today? I grew up in San Diego. My dad was in the Navy and my mom was like a stay-at-home mom. She's really creative, but was always very scared of the world in this way. She never like used her creativity or kind of like showed out with it. Like she was very private about it, but she was a big perfectionist. So we'd always be drawing, we'd be like doing crafts, a little bit of sewing and stuff. And then it was like watching Disney movies and old Disney movies. And so that was the Cinderella obsession. And she taught me how to write cursive really young, like before I was in school. I wanted to be an animator when I grew up. That was my dream was to work for Disney because of all the movies. And then my dad was really obsessed with the 80s. And that was really his like moment when he was like young. So then he was really obsessed with MTV and like Michael Jackson and pop culture in that way. And he's very like plugged in, always watching the news and like all this stuff. So I feel like that kind of formed what I am and who I am was like them. They're two different perspectives on life. Yeah. 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 Something else that I've always noticed about you in the way you exist in a room is that you have such a tangible sense of self. Your identity seems to be so clear to you. And I think it's safe to say that's not necessarily the case for everyone. And sometimes you find it, sometimes you lose it, and then you have to find it again. But at what age do you feel like you stumbled upon such a clear sense of who you were? Thank you. I guess I always felt a little bit like an island. I would get in trouble for it a lot when I was little because I'd like argue with my dad about something. My my mom would be like, you can't talk to him. Like you're a child and he's your father. Like you can't <laughs> talk like that. And I just, I don't know. I always had this kind of confidence in my ideas for some reason. And I don't know really where that comes from. Maybe it is from my mom because she was so kind of about building me and my sister up into this way. Like since she was so scared to take on any of her creative ideas or take on any recognition, like public recognition, even in our little town or community or in her family. She was always scared of that. She was really focused on making sure that me and my sister really knew ourselves and felt good about what that was. And I think that's probably where it comes from. But I was always doing my own little thing. I was always in my own little world. And I think because I live in that dreamscape all the time, it never really mattered to me if other people didn't really understand it or like didn't get it right away. I kind of was like, well, they're just not going to get it. It's okay. Like, I like it. So it's okay. Do you feel like there's ever a sort of sense of dissonance between that dreamscape you're talking about and the world around you? I think sometimes when I try and explain things or I see something a certain way and I realize another person's not seeing it that way, but to me, it's just so feels like it's the truth. It feels like there's only that way to see that. And that's not always the case. I don't know. I think being a doll, you always feel a little bit outside. I always feel like I I really believe that like life is a little bit of a performance, but I never felt like I was on stage or in the audience. I feel like I'm in the wings, like watching both. And then you see that's a conversation, actually. The people in the audience are also performing for the person on stage. And I feel like I always watched the world that way. I don't know. I guess that's how I've always felt. And so it all looks like a dream to me and neither spot really feels totally comfortable. But in a way, then they're both fine. They're both where you belong because you're sort of able to choose. I really love that idea because I think so much of being a creative requires that level of conviction you're describing in order to imbue something with enough meaning for other people to then see what you see. Yeah. Or for that work to then be made real. And so 
it all seems quite symbiotic. And obviously you're talking about things like the interest in becoming an animator and cursive writing and aesthetic driven things from a young age, but you also took photography in your senior year. So I'm guessing that yeah. kind of image making was something that was of interest quite early on. I think so. I think I always felt more comfortable speaking to people through images or through how I looked. I find it hard to articulate all of my ideas so simply and easily and definitively because I feel multiple things at the same time. And an image can kind of speak on multiple levels through emotion or color or shape or texture, like all at the same time. And there's something about also the ability that like a photo or an image, because to me, an image is also like the way you show up in the world and how you dress yourself. And there's something about the fact that can transform over time based on what it's next to or what it's relative mm -hmm. to. I, I think about how like my mom was really obsessed with Princess Diana growing up. And I think about watching all those like TV documentaries or whatever that would analyze all her clothes because she couldn't really speak necessarily about what she was going through out to the world. What she wore meant so much and was analyzed so much. There was this form of speaking to people without saying words. And so images always felt like that always made more sense to me. Like when people would ask me like, oh, who are you? What are you? None of it really felt like enough. Like it just never really felt right to be like, this is what I am and this is who I am because those things always felt like in motion. Mm -hmm. And I think images to me, it allows a little more fluidity in interpretation. And it's so much up to who's looking at it to see what they want. Whereas words define themselves in this way that I never really felt comfortable with. Words can be reductive, right? And what you're describing is almost being the art that speaks for itself, which is really interesting. Yeah, I think like, and I think that's how I approach what I do. And that's why it's hard for me to choose what I like more. People always ask me, do you like to style more? Do you like to model more? I think they occupy or they access different parts of me. And so to me, I don't want to lose either of those things. I like to be in front of people and, and perform in this certain way. And I always think fashion is a little bit like theater for people who have no talent. Like I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't act, but I can tell a story silently or something in this way. Yeah. But then I like to also control and make an image. And I have ideas in my mind that I need to get out in a certain way. And so to me, those are both valuable things. And I feel a little bit like, yeah, it's just a sensibility that I bring and I can occupy sort of all different types of roles in order to get that message across. Be in front or be behind, it doesn't really matter to me. It's, I think, yeah, it's just like bringing a sensibility and like a certain perspective to the world. That's what's important. Some people know you as a model. Some people know you as a stylist. Some people know you as the fashion director of Interview Magazine. But can we talk about how you arrived at this point of being such a multi-hyphenate? Because in my head, I feel like you were assisting a stylist before you even had that breakup moment at Mark, but maybe I imagine that. No, that's true. I was actually, so I was like living in San Diego. I just graduated school and then I stayed at home for a year. And then I was on Tumblr and Instagram and meeting all these different people who were part of this like independent downtown New York fashion kind of movement. I don't know if you would call it even that, but some of them were like designers and stylists or trying to model or trying to be a photographer or sort of all these different things. That's how I met Hari. And Hari connected me with um, Ian Bradley, who's a stylist, and I needed a job. And I was planning to move to New York. I was like, oh, I need to find something to do. And Hari connected me with Ian. And so I assisted Ian for like six months when I first moved here, but was also still doing kind of model-y things. And then six months later was that Mark show. So the model-y things, this was still prior to you being represented by an agency. Yeah. And the kind of turning point was walking that Mark Jacobs show in, I think, 2017. But that had come to you directly via Instagram, right? That wasn't through any type of representation. Yeah. So I moved to New York that first weekend I went out. We went to a, a party. And when I first walked in, Patrick from Becerra was there and was at the door. And he was like, oh, we want you to do this shoot for us. And I moved to New York on a Thursday. That was Saturday night. And so like, <laughs> okay. um, yeah. And then I met a bunch of other friends who ended up being like my really good friends now. And Ethan James Green shot that, uh, that the Kara shoot. And so that kind of was, it was all happening at the same time, modeling and assisting. And I didn't really see a difference between any of it because it all was just, I just want to be here and do it. 
Um, and then the Mark Jacobs thing happened because Hari was guest editing an issue of Candy and they did a shoot with all of Mark's new collection at the time with Inez and Manude. And then one of those photos became one of the covers of that issue. And that's how I got reached out to from like Mark's team. So what changed after you walked that show? Oh, I thought everything would change, but it didn't really. It was the same. I was still like assisting a little and then modeling a little and like being around. I thought I was like, oh, I'm going to get signed and go like to Paris and London and Milan and do the whole thing. And none of it really happened right away. I went and met with every agency and then they all said no to me. And they all were like, like what? Yeah, I don't know. It was funny. <laughs> I was trying to explain what I wanted to do and what I foresaw for myself. Yeah. And they just were like, Okay, cool. Good luck. <laughs> and then I think I met with some agency and they were like, maybe we'll sign you, but you have to stop styling or doing anything creative. And I was like, oh, wow. I don't know. Sure. Maybe that's a good idea. And then I think Ethan and a bunch of other friends were like, don't do that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then I got signed with my agents now and they were like, it's all okay. We love that you do whatever you want. Like, okay, cool. It's crazy to think about that today because obviously now everyone needs a side hustle. Yeah, now <laughs> who does one thing? And it's interesting because it's not the notion of a side hustle kind of has roots in economic needs and such. But I think a lot of people also do it just to have a more dynamic expression of their interests, but also their sort of identity. It's kind of both. Yeah. Yeah. It's both for me. It's I came to New York and I had friends who happened to be in the mix and doing things. And thank God it just kind of by chance of luck, we all ended up, it ended up working out for us, but it was like, I need to pay my rent. So like, yeah, if like a modeling gig could pay the rent and the styling assisting could pay the rent, like what I'm doing it and make it work. I don't know. You're talking a lot about your friends in the early days, which is definitely a significant pillar in your storyline. And I think it's safe to say that every so many years we see this cultural shift or some new generation that arrives and changes the game. And you yourself are very much a manifestation of such a shift in that you came up with all these Tumblr kids and yeah. there's this whole new generation <laughs> of dolls that were occupying spaces historically reserved for others. And there was just such a exciting, creative kind of not crescendo, because that would denote some type of downfall afterwards, but essentially some big, exciting change. So what do you feel having such a strong network with those you've come up with is unique to your generation? I don't even know if it's necessarily unique to our generation, because that kind of happens periodically. And I'm, mm -hmm. I guess I'm lucky enough to be part of something. And I, I do feel like really lucky to be part of something, because when I was starting to style and come forward and be like this is something I'm really doing and it's not just assisting or it's not just testing with friends it's like my one of my best friends Cruz who I moved here with Cruz Valdez she's a photographer and I was really in a sort of doubtful very nervous very scared oh are people gonna think I'm crazy for trying to do this or am I not gonna be able to make the work that's as good as the people that I love and are my heroes what's the point of adding to the noise I don't know there was all these different things and she was really like you like to do it, so just do it. And that's as much reason you need to make anything. And so it's carried me in a way that I don't know if I would have. You're talking about this like confidence in a sort of self that came from really early on. But I think you have doubts when you enter the world and then you have to be looked at by people and perceived by everybody. And so whenever it's been weak, it, it's been the people around me that kind of have carried me through and made sure that I didn't fall through the cracks. Because I think when you are really emotional and want to make things and because you have this like emotional obsession and desire towards it you can also like struggle under the pressure of it but i think the thing that is particular about my generation or maybe like this particular time i think the thing that's unique about this particular time is that we have so much information and i think there's something when i started learning about fashion and kind of understanding pop culture even, there was this real um, emphasis on understanding your history and the context and everything that kind of surrounds what we're doing. And it would be like, now you can go on the internet and hear a bunch of people talking about and spreading in information that's not necessarily checked. But on Tumblr and on like all the fashion boards that existed at the time, if you got a model wrong, you were dragged. 
And if you couldn't get the designer, you were clogged. Yeah. You couldn't go out there and say the wrong stylist did that shoot. People would let you know. You were kept on your shit. I don't know. You were kept right. And so there is this kind of import of the history and the knowledge, but then this like adaptability towards things changing. Because like the world that we learned about and were promised was pulled out from under us. All those reference points, I can list rattle off forever. Like I can't do that anymore. Those roles aren't there like the same way. Mm -hmm. And we can dream and recreate that all we want, but it's not coming back. So it's like, what can we do now? And how do we bring what we know into the future? Our moment is transitionary in that way. And I think that's beneficial because we have this kind of understanding of tradition, but also not necessarily this like blind reverence for it. It's almost like a micro generation. Yeah, I think so. Because it's like anything after, I don't know, like when I moved to New York was 2016, then all the maybe like right now, like the like kind of kids coming up right now and learning about fashion right now. This is just the world they live in. There's not even an understanding that something that this it's like it was changing when we were here, when we like got here and we had to live through that and navigate it and we had to learn it. Did that answer that question? <laughs> no, you did. Yeah, you definitely went into to depth. And I also think the reality is there's almost this sense that yourselves and perhaps a few others have held the fort down as New York lost a lot of market share. If you look specifically through industry, the wonderful thing is that culturally it will always be the heartbeat of the world in a lot of ways amongst other significant cities. But when it comes to something like fashion, which is the space you work in, we have seen a pretty significant exodus. And it's not only that you and a lot of your contemporaries have stayed keeping the sort of relevance of local creatives in place, but you also love New York. So can yeah. we talk a little bit about <laughs> <laughs> what you love about it, why you've stayed and what role you think New York plays in the larger culture? I don't know. I always dreamed about coming here like forever. And I don't know if that comes from like movies and TV shows and like an obsession with those New York girls. And then it was like finding out about like Pat Cleveland and Halston and Andy Warhol and, and the superstars and Edie Sedgwick and Candy Darling and like all the like girls in New York. And I don't know, I think it'll always hold that for me. And I guess that's what keeps people coming back. Mm -hmm. I think certain, I don't know, images are kind of like just burned into your mind. And I was just like, oh, I want to go do that. I want to go be there. And every time I walk around, I think I still see what the, the dream was. I, I, but that's just how I look at the world. I don't know. <laughs> it is interesting because obviously you are the fashion director of Interview Magazine, which is very much directly correlated to a lot of the references you've just made. So tell us about that moment and how significant it felt to achieve that role. It's crazy. I really shout out to Mel Ottenberg. I feel like he kind of like threw something in my lap that I didn't even know I could do and just had confidence that I could and would. I remember he took me out to lunch and was like, I want someone with an, their own agenda and to do what they want to do. And it doesn't matter that you don't really understand exactly what this role is. You're going to make it into whatever you make it. And I don't know, that's really cool. I feel like for him, it's so just like a normal thing that a doll could be the fashion director at a major magazine. And I feel like for everyone else, it's like, oh my God, it's the first thing ever. And I think a l part of the fact that it's so matter of fact to him it makes sense for me and feels aligned with how I look at it all and look at the world. We don't need to put a parade on every time something cool happens. <laughs> we just have to do cool stuff and make it right, I don't know, and put it out in the world. But I also have a total confidence in the fact that really at the end of the day, what this is documenting the world, and I know how to do that. Have you noticed any sort of application for your formal education in standard broadcast and print journalism coming into play here? I always think about how like being a fashion editor you're doing the same thing that like a, an editor who writes would do but you're just writing with clothes and you're writing with photos and so that's how I look at it and I'm like always looking for the story and the angle and the perspective and how to translate that to people because at the end of the day the people who are looking at it yeah a lot of them are into fashion but a lot of people who might see it might not know anything about fashion you're speaking to the world and you're speaking to people who need this explained to them a little bit you're talking about deciding what belongs in the time capsule of a magazine, what you're reporting on in culture, what it is you're choosing to feature or illustrate. And I remember in our episode with Ethan, he talked about the kind of catharsis of having gone from feeling as though he was the culture to observing the culture and the impact that had on his creative process or even sense of self in this industry. 
do you still feel like you're in that window? Are you still the zeitgeist? Um, I don't know. I feel like that's for other people to decide. <laughs> I guess so. I just like to go where the people are. I guess when we talk about TikTok, social media, Instagram, whatever, mm -hmm. I'm just like, to me, what a magazine is, that's just when it was created or whatever. I don't know, however, 100 years ago when they first started printing Vogue. That's just how people got their information and their news. And now, if you just think about how you do it, it's like you're not going to the newsstand every day to find out what's going on in the world. You, op you open up an app on your phone. Mm -hmm. And am I going to not go where the people are going to open up the app on their phone and look for information? Am I not going to be over there? That's insane. I don't know. Like, why would you not go and talk to people where they're at? But then still being such a, a obsessive of magazines and fan of magazines and the images those magazines have made and still make, like, why can't we apply like what we do here to this? Why can't we give it the same level of aesthetic rigor and, and beauty and fantasy and, and entertainment value or I don't know. I think that we should apply all of it to that space too. And you have this sort of performative quality as well, not in a way that ever feels disingenuous, but you always seem to be having fun. And a question that we've repeated on this show, because I just think it's relevant and interesting, is the role of the dream versus realism, right? Because we mm. definitely went through phases where dreamlike qualities were considered less authentic or whatever words people attributed to them. And that's certainly not the case of how you move through the world. So what do you think about the importance of the dream and how it does or does not negate the realism? To me, performance is a service. If people are watching you and you deny the fact that you're being watched, you're losing out. I think you're doing yourself and the people who are watching a disservice. If people are watching you, you might as well put a show on and give them something. And to me, that's a service because they're looking to like see something. And so give them something to look at. And that's what fashion is so much really. It's like a creation of desire and glamour is like this art of persuasion and, and kind of an argument you're making and hoping people agree with. I think a lot of the time how you do that is, is as important as what you say. Perhaps I'm just spending this entire conversation projecting things on you, but you seem to have such a sense of levity and optimism. And I definitely think that is a valuable tool to have when moving through the world as complex as ours. And perhaps today isn't any worse than it was another decade, but it's certainly challenging for some people. So what is your take on the kind of state of culture today? Ooh, oh, my God. <laughs> Big question. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? I guess I just approach the world with this kind of the idea that if you come to it with a smile, it'll smile back at you, <laughs> or at least I hope so. And I'm scared all the time, <laughs> but I feel like if you just put a brave face on and you bruise your cheeks and put your lipstick on, you're like, it's all going to be fine. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's how I see it. I don't know. I think for me, so much of why I'm able to take on what I am taking or doing what I'm doing is I see glamour and fabulosity and the fact that I'm lugging trunks of clothes up and down the stairs too. That's also fabulous. I hate it and it hurts my bones, but it's part of the idea I have of what this is too. It's the like staying late and getting the picture right or whatever. It's, the work is also like an image of glamour to me. I think if your like whole day isn't the point, then that sounds like torture. This would be torture if that was not fabulous to you. Well, it's all about framing, right? Yeah, fashion is torture unless it's fabulous to you. So it's like, I always just think if something bad's happening or something inconvenient, I missed a train or whatever, it's just like I'm being saved from something bad that's happened on that train that left me. <laughs> oh yeah, like the, what is it? it? Life isn't happening to you, it's happening for you, that type of a thing? Yeah, that's how I see it. <laughs> You've also said in the past that you live in delusion. And obviously the context was um, the sort of audacity one requires when being creative and bringing things into, you know, the world or the pages of the magazine or whatever it is that you're working on. But where did you learn such a thing? I think I learned that it was delusion because I saw the world in a certain way and everyone else was like, what are you talking about? So it wasn't delusion to me. It's delusion because... <laughs> And the response I got back was like, are you serious? <laughs> and I just believed in this thing that like, maybe other people didn't believe yet. 
And then now they do, it's fine. Or maybe they came around to it or whatever, and it's okay. It's definitely contagious. Oh, thank you. I think that's what you have to give to, to people. I feel like having faith is really important in whatever way that kind of manifests for you. I get very spiritual about fashion. Um, but I do feel like I have faith in, I just have faith in certain things happening and, and faith in certain ideas. And you just have to go and keep pushing on that until it works out. How does one get spiritual about fashion? I'm always talking about how like trends are simply messages from the muse. And if you're just like listening, you can hear them. You know, you could walk down the street every day and never see the flowers that are there. But if you just look down, you do. And these things are just given to us from the, the world and the universe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, no, I love that idea. What's that quote that people kept posting for a while? You can be spiritual and still wear Prada or something? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm into it. Speaking of wearing Prada, another significant moment, both in the culture as well as your own journeys, of course, the work that you've been doing with your dear friend, Hunter Schaefer. So let's talk about that experience and what it's been like in comparison to everything else today. Oh my gosh. I was always so terrified of the idea. I was like, no, I can't like celebrity styling. I, like, I don't, I can't do that. That's, that's a whole different universe. It's a whole different discipline. It requires a whole different level of commitment. And I don't know if I'm cut out for all that. That those girls are fierce <laughs> and I'm like so much about making a picture and like this thing that like from the back it's falling apart 17 different layers of whatever and all held by safety pins and glue back there and it doesn't have to be 360 gorgeous and that's what I do and I don't know there's something about the idea of putting something out into the world that everyone's gonna look at that was always terrifying to me but then Hunter was looking for a stylist last year and we've been friends since we were both modeling since like seven years ago, back during that 2017 mark time. And mm -hmm. I met her while I was assisting Ian on some Converse shoot, and she was still in high school, and she was like one of the talent. And so we've just been friends forever, but she asked me, and I just put it off, thought about it. Kind of what I did with the fashion director thing. Mel asked me, and I think I like left him hanging for a month or two months or something. I'm a very apprehensive person, I think. Interesting. Which I guess maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't think from, from what I give. But that's why I give that, because <laughs> I don't want people to know that. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. And then, and then it just was like, I don't know, I was, I was in a very year of yes. <laughs> like, yeah, let's do it. And finally, we're like, okay. Were you surprised by how incredibly celebrated it's been? It's wild. It's really like, it's been amazing. And it's really cool that people get it and like they're into it. And I do really love the kind of aspect that it's this living creature that kind of gets to walk out in the world. I feel like that's how both me and her look at it is this little kind of art creature project that we like release and then people take it and get to watch it. And, and it's an amazing, like huge stage. And she's so great and fab and loves fashion and gets it. And she pushes me and I push her and there's this really good, I don't know, it's really good because I think we, we both have the same commitment and obsession with it but two different perspectives around it and so i really like what happens when we start cooking in the lab together <laughs> i feel like i read somewhere that you said your taste was more classical than hers which i thought was interesting i think that she is like really into the kind of creative avant-garde artistic kind of like boundary pushing thing and I really love that too, but it's not my natural mode at this point. I think I was like that when I was really young, but then my mom drilled like decency and elegance into me and that's where I've sat now. I do think it's interesting because you're the fashion director of Interview, which is not a magazine I think of through that styling lens or style guide. No, I guess not. Yeah. But you're like a downtown New York cool kid and that's just not something you associate with classic and glamour and all of the things that you self-describe as. So I find that interesting. I guess... When I moved to New York and it was coming into this space that was more about deconstructing everything, I did feel a little bit like I stood out like a sore thumb because I wanted to polish everything up, at least about myself. And I tend to feel a little bit like an outsider in either of those spaces. I think I'm a little bit too scrappy for the glamorous classic uptown ladies. And I think I'm a little too like uptight for the edgy cool kids. I always feel a little bit like I'm neither, which I guess I was talking about earlier. But that tension to me, now I realize is actually like what I love and like what I want to develop. And, and those are the seeds I want to water. I like that about me. It was something that I used to be uncomfortable with. 
And now I realize like, actually, that's like why I think it can resonate. I think that's why even like the like Hunger Games tour could resonate with people because it was something that was like this clash against what you expect from this kind of polished red carpet space. But it's still valued the fact that elegance is like beautiful and and that we respond to it like we not that it's necessarily so much better or more important than anything else but it does get the people going you love to see it and i love to see it it makes me happy something that people have asked us to ask people and i always forget to because for some reason it's just not a question that comes to mind but outside of all these things we know you for what does an average day look like what other things are you interested in outside of this glamorous world of fashion Oh, that's always such a hard question to answer <laughs> yeah. for me. Because I'm like, I'm in this because I'm obsessed, babe. Like, every day is glamour for me. I wake up and it peels to the kitchen. I don't know if it's <laughs> not. I don't really have an average day. If I'm not doing anything, I can really, like, I got like, I, like, I go goblin mode and I just do nothing. And I sit in the bed and I, like, look at the wall. Like, so it's chopped. But then, and then some days it's fab and it's, I'm, you know, I'm at the office and then I go to, dinner and then go to party and then I dance all night and I don't get home until 9 a.m. Whatever. Like, it's always different. I guess when I'm not doing anything, I like to go like to the movies with my friends. <laughs> it's so boring. <laughs> She's normal. No, I'm not normal. <laughs> <laughs> we also have to ask you the obvious question, which is, of course, what is contemporary now? What is contemporary now? Ooh. Honestly, I think that fluidity, that kind of like ability to move in and between and all around everything you want to do. It's not about lacking definition. It's just about like allowing for more definitions to exist than one. I think that's what's now. And I think that's what's next. And it feels funny because you were saying like, like I was explaining the fact that didn't make sense to people when I was meeting modeling agencies. And now you're like, that's weird because that's just everyone's got to have that now Mm -hmm. so that feels like where it's going and i don't know that's always just been the way i approach it and i feel like that's it thank you dara thank you for saying yes it was fun as to be expected thank you i hope i made sense (laughs) thanks for tuning in to this episode of what's contemporary now a special thanks to our show's producer cheyenne asadi who makes it all possible Audio post-production by Griffin James, with original theme music by Joseph Top Miller and Chase Coughlin of The Black Soft, and visual design by Aaron Meager and Graham Prentice. Subscribe now to be the first to catch new episodes every week, and if you've enjoyed listening, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review and let us know your thoughts. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more listeners like you. Follow us on Instagram, threads, and LinkedIn for additional content, and join the conversation around what is contemporary now.